Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another Schoolscape online webinar. The purpose of these webinars is to help your school by introducing you to companies and people that can really help you with your school. And today's one, I am super excited. I think everyone has heard the term robotics. It has been thrown around, um, but it's sometimes not always correctly understood. So uh, now we have a kind of 30 minutes action packed. Uh, I'm going to start with an interview with Adam, and then I'm going to to Rajesh, who's going to join us from uh, Resolute Robotics. And we're actually going to look at practically how a school can introduce robotics. So I always love it when we can actually do practical stuff. And Rajesh is also going to give us a live demo or some examples of two schools and exactly how they did it. But live with me now is Adam. So Adam is a WITS lecturer. He's also part of Resolute Robotics. Adam, welcome on stage. Thanks, Pete. Great to be with you. Hi, everyone. Brilliant. Uh, Adam, we are going to start talking robotics, but um, I heard a bit of your story the other day, and I know it ties in with robotics. Can you give us just a, a bit of an overview of your personal story? Yes, absolutely, Pete. Um, so I'm, my story goes back to when I was young, actually, when I was in school. Uh, as I started high school, I started to get a little ill and I had to have some surgeries and those surgeries actually took me out of school entirely. So I missed out on half of standard six, grade eight. Um, so that's grade eight. I missed out on most of grade nine, 10 and 11. In fact, the whole of grade, of, uh, the whole of grade 11 I missed out. And then I did my matric year over two years. And I missed out on all of the schooling, all of the socialization at the time and as a result of it, it was, it was quite taxing, it was quite challenging, but what I later realized in life is it created a huge opening in my life for technology. Because while at home, I had a computer and I had access to dial-up internet. It was the early days of the dial -up. Exactly. And I used to connect up to the internet and explore the internet. I started to download code to write my own software viruses and I would write a virus and release it on my computer and I would completely break my computer and lock myself out then I would need to go and swap my hard drive out and what was really happening as I was getting into this exploration phase where my imagination and intrigue was, was awakening this was a portal to the world for me this was actually my way of getting out there I was on our internet relay chat talking to people that was my socialization I was learning language through games and so I had a very unusual schooling and missed out on very many opportunities, but it really opened other doors for me in remarkable ways. And that was really the start of my professional life without my realizing it. I love that. It sounds a bit, uh, a bit like lockdown, uh, but I think you were locked down yeah. for very, very different reasons. Um, so. And if I, heard, if I heard correctly, you actually used to dismantle your whole computer and rebuild it because you had nothing else really to do. Pretty much. I mean, anything electronic, I would be trying to mess with it and take it apart. So the computer was no exception. I was building up a computer. I would try and scramble for some new components. And I was just really what I, what I was doing was tinkering. And a lot of, you know, a lot of young people have these kinds of interests and love to tinker and play around. And we actually, funnily enough, have found the, the very, you know, some very, very great engineers start off tinkering. Yeah. Some great engineers yeah. start off playing around. They have a curiosity about something they want to understand how something works they might want to even take it apart and maybe to the dismay of many of their parents you know they're breaking all the appliances around the house but this is actually a very wonderful trait <laughs> okay so let's jump a little bit ahead you are now a lecturer at uh Vitz. Um, yes what uh, in line with tinkering what what is your kind of expectation of a student when when they arrive what do you expect them to have what do you you look for in them Great, and I, th I think that same trait of curiosity is so critical. Something that I think that we, we really need for university students is the ability to problem solve and solve emergent problems that are either convergent or divergent. So there may not be a solution to these problems, but they need to go through the problem solving process anyway and come up with fringe solutions or pivot into another domain. And the ability to do that problem solving, that creative thinking and approach a problem with critical thinking and a critical mindset is something that's so utterly useful and so important and something that unfortunately we don't see enough of. 
And it's a little bit about confidence. It's a little bit about being able to take the initiative. And it's a little bit about agility and learning as you move through a problem, learning to change as you're moving through a problem and be able to adapt your trajectory based on the problem and the measurements yeah. that you receive about it, you know? And I think that's great. If I think of the curveball that COVID-19 has given us, you know, these are the kind of skills that I think of. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of schools that are watching now, and I think they've had to incredibly adapt. Um, Absolutely. And I think that, that that skill is kind of so key. Um, and for your department, and maybe you can just mention what your department is, like what, what, do, you, what do you want, you know, ideally by the time you finish, because I know this ties in with robotics, what are the critical skills you would like to see these graduates going out into the world with and you, you mentioned COVID-19 being it, it's so amazing how at times of crisis we are forced to shift ourselves and we should ordinarily be moving at this pace to advance our species you know but at times of crisis they it, we catalyze ourselves into new spaces and I'm sure all schools are dealing with this need to catalyze into digital spaces so it's such a fascinating time that you know this this manifests during these times from a skills perspective in schools, by the time people graduate and leave, we again want them to be great problem solvers by that time. Mm -hmm. And I keep talking about problem solving because the world is so emergent. And if we juxtapose our current trajectory with technology, technology is just advancing more and more and more rapidly. So the rate of change is literally exponential. We've seen, we're all familiar with the term exponential now because we've seen so many of these viral curves warning us about how the virus is gonna spread exponentially. But technology in a really good way is changing exponentially too. And it's changing exponentially according to Moore's law and according to other theories of science that show and measure how technology is changing over time. Now, that means that the world of tomorrow is different from the world of today, but it is gonna be more different than today is from yesterday. And that is a very key principle. The world is changing, but the fundamentals of science and technology stay the same. So we can't really equip students for the time they're going to graduate. What we need to be doing is equipping their minds to cope with the world when they graduate, equipping them with the skill sets required to learn and navigate that world, apply their knowledge and solve the problems of the future, which are emergent and we can't necessarily know them just like only very few human beings on the planet predicted something like COVID-19. It just wasn't knowledge, it's, it's emergent. So, you know, that, that's really the, the world in which we find ourselves. We need to be able to, to move forward with agility, to be able to tackle the current problems in the world. And uh, we like to think that we grow engineers who are able to do that, you know, at FITS, we, I believe we do. You mentioned my department, that's the only thing I haven't answered. I'm in the electrical and information engineering departments. Um, I practice in biomedical engineering, which is applying medical, um, to applying engineering principles to medical problems. So I lecture in medicine and in the engineering faculties. That's amazing. Um, okay, million dollar question, because uh, it ties in with what we're talking about. What, why robotics? Um, what role does robotics play in this? And more importantly, why is it so, in your opinion, so critical? It's a, it's, it's a great question. I think robotics is contained in a few different realms. There's a physical component to it and there's a software component to it. Now, it bridges those two worlds very elegantly into one integrated thing. And that thing may be Pepper the robot that you can go and interact with and meet or it might be a car that follows a line or a sound in a room or a little vacuum cleaner. All of those devices that I just mentioned have software and they have hardware components to them. Robotics brings those two together in a really practical real world way. And I think the reason why I'm passionate about robotics is because robotics is one of those areas where you can go and tinker and you can make something move in the real world. And when it moves, it's utterly gratifying because you've done that. So you, you yeah. need to iterate, you need to measure, you need to problem solve, you need to identify what needs to happen in the future and what actions are coming next. You need to predict what's emergent in the future. So what will you have to think about when this thing is operating? For instance, a vacuum cleaner will have to think about furniture. What happens if it doesn't spot furniture? What happens if it bashes into the furniture? All of these different questions arise. So now you've got a multi-dimensional complex problem that is 
in time and in space, and you're dealing with it from a hardware and software perspective, and you're making measurements associated with it, and bringing all of this together into something that actually moves and does something. So it couldn't be more fascinating. It's like really an amazing field. Exciting. Okay, I've, I've got to ask this question. Uh, and uh, we're going to move, just for all of our viewers, we're going to move on to Rajesh uh, soon, who's going to really show us how, how you can introduce coding uh, in your school. But before we get there, Adam, imagine now you are back at home, you are standard six, grade eight. Um, it's, uh, you're not there because you're sick, you're there because it's, uh, everything's locked down. What would you, as a kid, have loved when it comes to a class and stuff on robotics, what uh, I'm just interested to hear what you would have loved because I think it will help uh, the kind of the people that are watching, the teachers understand how they need to position it for their learners. Such an such an awesome question to take me back. I think I would have loved the opportunity to be able to. So there's such a there's such a step change in everything you need to know to be able to get to the end of of one of the applications we just described. So what I would have loved is you know, these, and I'm almost introducing Resolute because this is why I believe in Resolute because I wanted to get interested in Resolute because I knew it would have remarkably changed my personal trajectory if I was younger on uh, in life and I'd had access to this content because having something where you can learn on rails, you know, you can learn with a, a framework and you can learn at your own pace and have a little kit that you can tinker with and play with. I mean, that, that would have been absolutely amazing for me. So, any application where I didn't have to really go out and, and really search for the information. And if this was baked into school, I think I would have been over the moon. For me at the time, school was something that was quite mechanical. It was very traditional and we just had to kind of grind through a syllabus to get through it. And I'm, I'm so pleased to know how school has changed since I was in school, because I think my experience of school is dramatically different from the experience of school that people are creating today, um, which is so superb, you know. But when I was in school, I think I would have been over the moon to have any of this in the curriculum. I didn't even know the term engineering until I was in O week at Wits University. And that's a true story. I went and begged them to let me in. <laughs> ah, love it. Um, Adam, thank you. You've been fantastic. Uh, you can stay there. I've just invited Rajesh uh, on stage. So um, Rajesh uh, is from Resolute Robotics. Um, Adam is a lecturer, uh, but is also part of uh, Resolute. And uh, they have some incredible practical skills on, on introducing robotics. So uh, Rajesh, welcome on stage. Thank, thank you for you. being here today with us. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone, if you could join. Cool. I know you're about to get into some slides just to show us how to practically implement robotics. Before we get there, um, Rajesh, in your view, what, what is the feel at the moment um, amongst learners when it comes to uh, robotics? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I think I have to look back at where I was in high school and <laughs> so long uh, once I've, we were doing robotics, I kept thinking, you know, why isn't the students aren't taking to it? And then Kind of when I thought about when I was in school, I think the only thing I cared about was a bit of sports and actually a girl that I had a crush on in school. So you have to get into the mentality of a student to be like, how do you make it attractive? And I was the furthest thing away from being excited about robotics. Uh, if anything, I had a strict Indian dad who was like, you will do engineering. And I've never uh, played around with robotics or anything in my life. So when I got to electronic engineering, I think it was the biggest shock of my life of um what it's all about but more importantly just to brush up on what adam said it's the close technology is the closest thing to magic we actually have so um kids these days right now when they hear the word robotics um it's such a fear for them it's like they feel they're not competent enough and that they have to be intellectuals and they have to get 90s for maths and science and it's such an elite field and that's that stigma that we have to break because i wasn't one of those students i was Sure, I had a good math <laughs> math mark, but uh, everything else was below par, and I was just an average student in a school. And I wish I had been exposed to, whether it was forcibly or in some club or something at an earlier stage, I would have been just, my mind would have exploded at a much younger age than third year university. 
This is brilliant. Um, Rajesh, we're getting so many questions coming in about how we actually do it. I think I'm going to ask you, if you don't yeah. mind, um, jumping into your presentation. I, I think uh, I know we did a pre-run of it, and I think you've really thought through. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand over to Rajesh, who's just going to present on just some of the thinking uh, and how do you actually implement robotics into your own school. That's fantastic. Um, thank you so much, guys. Um, so before we actually chat about an implementation and we look at two case studies of a school actually doing it, um, I think it's very critical for schools at the stage there are. There's so many schools that are, there's Lego going on, there's draw, uh, drone programming, there's scratch coding, and there's Go Labs, and there's so many things out there that almost, I feel some of the schools lack a bit of clarity in how do we start and how do we structure it going forward? So I think the best way to start is just to roughly go through a robotics diagram, um, almost in a sense to say, is robotics a part of your five-year plan at school? Is it something that you want to do? You know, if not, the biggest question is why, and that's a separate conversation. And if so, yes, um, there's different options. As a school, you need to decide, are you going to start off with an in-curriculum approach and extramural clubs that you can run at the school or a completely privatized approach where you get a you get a company to come in and you actually run these courses, but the parents and the company deal with it, but you're just merely a promoter of robotics. Then the next thing is finance. I think this budgeting is a big thing for schools. And um, one of the things is the school can fund it. Um, another option is parent funded. For example, parents actually pay extra in the beginning of the year and they get access to this robotics curriculum, or it could be a hybrid option. I think we've seen schools successfully, some schools buy the components and then they ask the parents to pay for the licensing fee. It can mm -hmm. be a hybrid option, which can work in with schools, which is quite nice. Um, and then the project type, um, there is diff three different types of projects I could call it. Uh, you get your software coding based project, which is more your Python, your c -sharp game development um, and your scratch coding. Um, obviously you need a hardware for that, which goes back to hybrid, but that's kind of a cost effective way that you can get started. Then you get your hardware project, which is where schools are using drones and your Lego robotics. And it's a great place to start. Big advocate for it is it builds logical thinking. But robotics in its sense, like Adam touched, is a hybrid approach. It's, it's, it's a word that connects the software and the hardware world together into one. And that's what it's kind of required. And in a robotics project, students get exposed to data sciences, which is the biggest thing the world is heading into. That's why you hear the words machine learning and artificial intelligence all comes from optimizing data. Um, and then you get your coding that students can get into, and then you get your actual electronic and computer engineering aspect for it. So a hybrid project that involves the word robotics is the best option to actually start off a student with. And then the schools need to decide in terms of an age group, um, are we targeting the grade fours to sevens or are we going towards the high school? The one thing I can say is, I mean, we look at other countries overseas and we're like, oh, South Africa is so behind, everyone else is moving so fast. That is definitely not the case. I think uh, South African primary schools have done a, try to do the best jobs, for example, Kiros and stuff to try get Lego robotics, scratch coding, a lot of things in place in the primary school. And that's where it belongs. It's a fundamental place. But moving into high school, um, you need something for the kids who've done scratch coding and Lego robotics. How do you captivate them at an older age? And if you've missed that whole boat, how do you get them when they make their subject choices in grade nine? How do you know if they need to choose the field of computer or IT or engineering? How do you know what the right stuff to choose? Is? So these are all critical questions. I think once the school can sit to the management team and decide on it, you're going to have more clarity on how you can implement it. So just to run more on it, if we look at a case study, um, I'm using St. Mary's DSG for an example because they're one of the services that we offer. And uh, they've chosen the in-curriculum option. It's school funded. It's a hybrid of hardware and software projects and they have it in the curriculum for grade seven to nine. So if we look at it, I think the biggest success, they have a six step that I've noticed that all schools that do it successfully. These are the six steps that you need to do. And specifically with St. Mary's, first of all, the management team that met, um, they had a clear five-year plan. Robotics has to be part of their plan and they made it a big goal to try roll it out. And it comes from that management team to get the whole staff on board that we're going to pursue robotics. The next big question is scheduling. I think every single school asks that, like, you know, how are we going to fit this in if we're doing an in-curriculum option? 
I think a very interesting way St. Mary's has actually done it is if you look at music, um, they've done it in their grade seven to nine. Students actually have a choice to pick between music, art, drama, and robotics. And uh, obviously this is a very difficult choice where you might have staff members saying, no, but drama and art is also important, but so is robotics. So they've structured the timetable in such a way that students go into their specific subject field. And this is very possible between grade sevens to nines because Although it's a non-promotional subject, um, it's something that can be examinable um, with the right curriculum, just like French. So you can introduce it in your school and you can make it a compulsory subject or you can divide it into the streams like St. Mary's has. Then it's to identify the right staff member. This is the most important thing. I think every school needs to have a champion or a pine, uh, someone that pioneers this whole movement. And in most schools, they look towards the IT head of department because position to make this decision. Um, and also what St. Mary's has done is, which is very cool, is they've actually got a full-time staff member that they've hired, a facilitator, and uh, it's a young university student who's just come out of school. Um, they're also in the uh, education space at university teaching robotics now, and uh, that person teaches grade seven, eight, and nine robotics, and also higher grade CAT, which also fits it quite nicely into the schooling system. And I think the next thing is budget. I think this is the most important thing for schools to consider. Um, there's two aspects to it. So St. Mary's went the components and licenses where I think with any big project in school, whether it's an AstroTurf or a, or a rugby field or whatever, there needs to be an investment that goes down. So what we realized is you could get a kit for your child for less than 2000 Rand per student. And that kit could last you three to five years in a school. So it's an investment that you can put down. Uh, St. Mary's purchased 30 to 35 kits from us and they work it in groups. So you can almost work it between 30 to 90 kits in your school. And at the end of the year, when the curriculum is finished, you just reuse it, um, which is a great way to go about it. And the curriculum. So we kind of piloting this year a, a three course curriculum with them. Um, the kids are start, the girls are actually starting off with access control, which is very cool. They're learning how to program an RFID tag. Um, which is which is something that we use at all the gym memberships and then they go into autonomous line following car where there's sensors that pick up values um, and then you actually need to decide how to maneuver your car and then we're throwing in a little bit of software development which is your c-sharp game development i think when we were all young we were fascinated by snake um, and also now it's the flappy bird so all these 2d arcade games just with the access to a computer and internet, kids can build these games. And this also lowers your costs because when you introduce a software project, your hardware component costs go down. So this is what's being piloted. I think it's going fantastic. And to look at it from a different perspective, um, for a school, steps one, two, three, and five is something that they need to take, whereas steps four and six is, uh, is something that can be outsourced to a company like, for example, us or any other robotics company that can provide a facilitator and a curriculum to best suit what your school kind of needs. Um, I think then the next case study is actually quite interesting. And this is something that uh, South Towns College, Woodhill and Hatfield Christian School are actually using. All of them are the IEB curriculum. And this is quite interesting because what this does is you can kind of play in both fields. Obviously, you need your management team to go in for it. The schedule becomes extremely easy because you make it Mondays, two to three after school, there's a robotics club that's happening and students can come participate. It's an easy way to get started. I think identifying the right staff member, like we've already discussed, someone needs to run it. You don't need to hire a full-time teacher. In, over here, you can just hire a facilitator. And that facilitator can be a just like a sports facilitator. It could be a university student who's studying engineering who comes in and helps out with these clubs. And in terms of your budget, the school doesn't even have to take anything. Um, the school can use some of its sports budget to maybe sponsor some kits so that the kids could use it. Or otherwise, it can be completely parent funded. But there is some cost when you enroll for some competitions that the kids actually participate in. So to get your Lego mine storms and to get your mining, um, to navigate your robot through mines, there's so many competitions out there that you might need to put in a little bit of an investment for that. And, uh, the and also another thing is if you choose the right curriculum option, for less than 350 rand, and that's what South Downs College at Woodhill and uh, Hatfield Christian School are doing is, the parents are paying less than 350 rand per month, and we have a really nice club that we've created of about 20 to 30 kids who come on a Saturday, and they do three courses throughout the year. So it's a curriculum approach, but as an after-school option. And then your courses and competitions are something that you can have to consider, which I've already gone through. So I think to come kind of conclude, um, your your options that you have to weigh off is in your in curriculum, you are going to have a high intake uh, because there's no sports and other commitments to take away from students. 
but you need a trained staff over here. You could use a facilitator. It is a high budget, but you could work it into the school fees or it could be something separate that the parents pay for. And in curriculum, you just have to work out your scheduling where there's extra murals. It's kind of an after school activity that um, the kids can participate in. So yeah, Peter, I think that's the two case studies that I actually have yeah. of uh, successful schools being implemented. Brilliant. Um, just for all of our viewers out there, if you have any questions, please pop them in the questions tab on the right. Um, I can then direct them to Rajesh. Uh, Rajesh, uh, I think the first question, um, you've spoken about either a staff member to be trained um, or a facilitator. If a school wants to use a staff member, is there a way that they can use a staff member that uh, might not have robotic skills? 100%. So one of the things that we do, I think there's apart from the five things offering is teacher training is a big thing that we offer, consultation and teacher training. And at schools like Woodhill and your Hatfield Christian schools, we have biology teachers that are taking this. You will realize very soon that there are always four or five kids in your class that know so much. And if you just have a teacher that's willing and that has the basics of how electronic components work and how to set kids up, it's a great space to facilitate because as students with the curriculum online and as they learn you'll see students will start helping each other and that's where project-based learning becomes so critical that's amazing um uh let's talk about kits um elaine uh, asks cost of kits uh, maybe you could also advise and propose what kits are there what is available so i'm going to share my screen again i have a, a slide for the products and the kits um so if you quickly look at um is my screen being shared Yes, got it. Great. Okay. So if you look at this, these are the kind of courses that we offer. Um, your solar powered project, your introduction to Arduino based coding, which is kind of what everything stems over. Your capacitive touch based windmill and your temperature regulator are all your introductory projects. Just to get the kids the idea of the hardware and the software projects combined. And then for grade seven, you have your smart garden, you have your automated hand sanitizer, which is which is a great project. Um, I actually have a video of it working that we've built. Um, and then a home automation system. Um, this is manually controlling your garage, the lighting in your house. We teach kids how to do all of this. Then moving over to grade eight, you have your access control line following car app development and grade nine is more your Python, C sharp game development and your smart e sorters. So kind of, if you look at uh, when it comes to robotics, the grades are just uh, something to outline it by. It's more your level one, level two, level three. I think a grade nine person can start off with a grade seven, which is level one, which introduces them and be equally engaged. Um, I think any person who's starting should start off in those levels to help them. So I think apart from these courses that you can implement in your school, um, your consultation, uh, teacher training, providing facilitators, your curriculum, or setting up of extramural clubs is something that we do provide. Awesome. Um, and so you've spoken about the opportunity of um, offsetting the cost directly to the parents um, and yeah. having them handle that. Um, so that would be extra curriculum. If the school decides to purchase, I think you mentioned a price roughly for kits of around 2000 Rand for kits. Is that correct? Yeah. So it completely depends on the project you choose. Um, I think if you choose an introductory set of projects, your kits could come down to about a thousand rand. Um, if you choose the more complicated ones, it goes up to 2000. But for extra murals, um, almost you could structure it in such a way where with the kits and a curriculum, um, if it's 3,500 rand for the year, it's almost 350 rand a month for parents to kind of participate for a 30 week robotics mm -hmm. curriculum, which is something nice. Cool. Um, we, we had a question coming from Carol. She says, you know, can we introduce Lego based robotics at grade one and upwards? Um, maybe if you could actually just address the, the point, well, what, what age is the right age to start robotics? Oh, yeah. So um, Lego based robotics and there's a lot of also a lot of online free uh, product products out there. Uh, Tinkercad and I think in the chat, Leo shared also another website. Um, so Lego robotics is absolutely fantastic. And the premise of that is it, it includes introduces scratch coding. Scratch coding was created from MIT and it's essentially block coding. And what that does is it teaches your kids logical code. So if I come to a robot, if it's red, um, drag a block, stop. If it's green, go through. So I think your scratch coding is primarily for your uh, primary school students to get the idea of how code works. Then there's a lot of softwares that actually take that whatever's in that block, which makes it easy for a child to drag and drop, 
there comes a practical to it where you actually want to custom that custom something into that. Mm -hmm. For example, if there isn't a block orange, which means slow down, um, how do you create a custom block like that? And that's where coding actually comes in is where you can then start programming your own blocks or then transition completely into programming. So I think scratch coding can be used up to grade nine, but I think if you're in grade seven, eight or nine, it's more an introduction. And I think the best thing would be to go into coding based like Arduino, which is so easy to learn. Awesome. Uh, Rajesh, uh, I think you guys have been phenomenal with all of this info and just giving practical ways of looking. Uh, I have to ask, so Resolute Robotics, uh, you guys do this full time. Um, this is uh, your, your focus. Um, how do you work with schools? Um, what, is, what is it actually that you as a business do? So um, going back to the one of the slides, so what we do is it's very so if a school wants to implement robotics, I think we're a very affordable solution in making that come true. So it's not that they have to buy the components and the curriculum from us. I think if they want to use us to consult, to set up a club, that is also something we offer. We do teacher training. Um, and then on top of that, we also obviously provide a very outlined curriculum. Um, that is in school, that is actually being implemented and, and working quite great now, and also an extra meals club. So any schools, I think going back to the tree diagram, if, they, if a school can decide what approach and how they want to do it, um, if you can contact us, we would be able to send you a proposal, whether you're a government school with absolutely no budget or you're a private school that has something to work with, we can make something happen. Cool. Um, Rajesh, one question I just have to ask because it has come through. Um, now with COVID, kids being at home, how easy is it for them at home to continue with robotics extra, extra curriculum uh, um, or just keep up with classes? Is, is that easily adaptable? Yeah, so um, there's two options for that. Um, I think right now with level four and level three delivery of ICT goods is allowed. So what we've realized is we running there is a couple of competitions and products that we have where kids can actually buy the components kit we have a full-on learning management platform and everything is video based the students can buy our stuff um, and we currently are running it at a few schools and continue at home um, but if hardware is a bit of a mission um, a cost effective solution is our c-sharp game development course which is great for grade seven to nine all you need is laptop and an internet and you can learn how to program games Okay, cool. I'm going to give you, we literally out of time, but we've got a couple of questions. If you can give 30 second answers for these. Uh, Oscar says, I like the teacher's training option. Is it possible to do this remotely? Uh, Rajesh, we have, you are back. back? There yeah, you're back. There um, Rajesh, can you, can you teach teachers remotely? Yeah, I'm sure you can. I think the best way for a teacher training to actually do is to run through one of the courses because it kind of covers everything. So all our modules and everything is online. Uh, we do set cool. something up if they want to do online where we do like a eight, eight, eight session Zoom where they go through the course, ask us questions and stuff like that. Yeah. Cool. And then last question, uh, which coding languages are popular? So what would you recommend? What do you think the teachers should be looking at to teach uh, their learners? Okay, I'm going to take more than 30 seconds to answer this because it's very important. <laughs> so when you're talking about coding, um, it's very important that you realize this. There's, there's different types of it, right? And with where the world is heading, I'm someone that doesn't get excited by web development or coding that, that you actually get when you join software companies, but the data aspect of it excites me more. Mm -hmm. So the biggest language and the most popular language out there right now is Python. So every single student coming out of high school, um, I think should be exposed to Python because you could use that for your software coding stuff, but also for your data and in university. So that's the first thing. And then the second completely depends on what field you want to go to. I think anything like Java and your C sharp um, is a viable option for students to do. And going back, if you can master one coding language, it's so easy for you to learn uh, different coding languages. It's just the syntax that matters. So get started. <laughs> that's the most important thing. Awesome. Awesome. I see Adam also agrees. Uh, Python right now. Um, Rajesh, you have been absolutely fantastic. Adam, thank you. We appreciate you both coming on. Um, our commitment to our viewers is to keep to 30 minutes. I know we've been four minutes over, so my apologies, but I thought it was important to get those last questions out. Um, I have just shared uh, the email address, the website. I think if you are a school and you are sitting in a situation where you're going, we need help, uh, how do we do this? Please connect directly with uh, Rajesh and the team at info at resolute 
edu.com and I've also put their web address so you can find out a bit more about them. If you are one of those teachers that is feeling this is a bit daunting, how do I do it? Connect with them and they can give you options. Um, so Rajesh, Adam, thank you so much. We appreciate you being live with us today. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Cool. And to all the schools out there that viewed us, thank you. Go check out uh, Rajesh and his team. Uh, we have more webinars next week, so we will keep you updated. Uh, we appreciate your time, and we also appreciate the amazing job that you are teaching uh, out there in very uncertain times. So thank you, everybody. Thank That's you. us out. Cheers, everybody.